If there was a Hall of Fame, a Cooperstown for movie directors, they'd need more than just a plaque to honor Martin Scorsese. They'd probably need an entire wing to commemorate such classics as Raging Bull, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, and Goodfellas. In his last film, Cundon, he examined the struggles of Tibet, but now he's back on New York City's Mean Streets with his latest film, Bringing Out the Dead, and here is the trailer. Rule number one, don't get involved with patients' daughters, you understand? Our mission, to save lives. Blast off! Bringing out the dead, I am pleased to have Martin Scorsese here. Welcome back. Good Good to to have you back here. Thank you. Uh, It's not easy to make this kind of film. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> at my age at your age <laughs> in this city <laughs> with a pregnant wife <laughs> yes it, it, it's it is it is remarkable it's remarkable yeah. now we were out 70 we were the film took 70 night five nights to shoot yeah we shot we stayed on a night schedule and um, 45 of those nights let's say 40 or 50 of those nights were in the streets yeah uh is it easier tougher more, you know than it used to be it's a little tougher a little tougher than it used to be i think physically it's tougher it's just you're out there in the street and yeah. uh uh, 25 years ago, you have, uh, you know, you have the energy to keep moving. I mean, you have a little more energy. Uh, at night, there's something that happens if you work too long at night, especially on 54th Street and 11th Avenue. Like what? <laughs> well, you start to get very depressed around 4 in the morning. It's always 4 in the morning, you know? Yes. You're never going to get finished with the film. This picture will never end. Yeah. You know, there'll be another ambulance shot to take, you know? And uh, one third of the picture takes place inside the ambulances. So I was usually in the back with the script person, and uh, I do the dispatcher's voice a lot in the picture. And um, uh, we simply, we had a run. We had a run from 42nd Street, from 57th Street down to 42nd, down Broadway or 7th Avenue. Yeah. And we'd have to get a whole scene in during that period of time. Right. Because shooting sideways, you'd get lights on in the buildings. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, other streets, you might as well be shooting in, you can shoot in Santa Fe. Nobody's going to see anything. You can intercut it any way, any way you want. But you have to see the city as another character. So a lot of light coming from the buildings there. So what had happened is that we would start around 57th Street and, and 7th or Broadway, go all the way down. Uh, the actors are getting heated up in the middle of a scene. Yeah. And then a red light would occur. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the police up. were great. Yeah. Uh, mayor's office was great. But because of the uh, the rig we had, which was a, a big picture car pulling another picture car with an ambulance on top of it with lights, picture cars around the ambulance it was like a convoy. Because of that, we couldn't stop. We couldn't go through red lights, so we had to stop for red light. The actors would have to start all over again. Then we'd have to go back to position number one. Go down 42nd Street to West. Go up to 57th on 8th Avenue. Come around. Yeah. Uh, it was like the condemned of Altona. Yeah. You know, we're sitting in there. <laughs> <laughs> just depressed every time, you know. But uh, it was quite quite a show. But this, there is this Scorsese love affair with this city. Uh, yeah. You know, you're born here. <laughs> yes. Went to high school here. Yes. Went yes. to NYU yes. to yeah. school. Yeah. You live here now. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Mean Streets, other films, yeah. Raging Bull, mm-hmm. all come out of this place. That's right. Yeah. Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver. Uh, yeah. Goodfellas too. Yeah. Goodfellas. Exactly. Oh, got, it goes you know, on and on. Uh, no, I just, this is my place. I mean, I guess I'm provincial in that, in that way of thinking. Yeah. Uh, um, where I grew up in the Lower East Side, uh, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me now as I, as I get older that I came from sort of a small Sicilian village in yeah. the midst of Manhattan, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, as I said, I never even went to the West Side. I walked the first day uh, for registration at NYU. I just walked west on Houston. <laughs> and just, hey, there, there were artists there, <laughs> bohemians, you know. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. It was a whole other world. Um, that, that was, was really your first introduction to Beyond the Neighborhood. Exactly, yeah. Because the high school I went to, Cardinal Hayes High School, right. which is a wonderful high school, uh, was in the Bronx. But you just get in the subway. You don't see anything. Yeah. You stay in the subway 45 <laughs> minutes, you're there in the Grand Concourse, you know. But uh, there's no doubt, I, I, I do love the city. I, I, I keep saying to myself, too, the lighting. I, I, I realize that um, my introduction to film was through writing and through editing rather yeah. than cinematography. Yeah. Because uh, I looked around I, over the years. I, I kept... Uh, Michael Powell, the great director, he was able to tell the time by just looking at the sun in the sky. Right. And uh, Steven Spielberg is able to tell when, because uh, it was a wonderful story in Empire of the Sun. He um, arrived on the set early one morning because I asked him how he got this shot of the last kamikaze yeah. getting ready to get in their planes to go uh, and fight and die. And they were silhouetted against the rising sun, a real rising sun. It was amazing. He said, well, I got there early and I saw the mist on the ground and I knew immediately the sun was going to come up that way. So he got the camera and shot the shot. I said, if I, you know, I'm in New York. If I saw mist on the ground like that, I'd be run. <laughs> Something's on fire. Yeah, exactly. you know, so I, you know, because he grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, it's right. a different thing. Me, um, 
lighting for me is you you know turn a light on in the hallway and, and yeah. that's basically right. I never really saw um, I couldn't tell where the sun was. I couldn't tell from a cloudy day or a bright day because of the nature of the buildings we were in. Shadows and everything. Shadows, alleyways, hallways. And then in 1965, there was a, a city ordinance that uh, every building has to have two lights out front. Right. And then we started to see the neighborhood a little bit at night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they got those new lamps, the, the, yeah, the street right. lamps. Street lamps right. the, yeah. Yeah. So then things started to brighten up. But up to that point, I never really understood where to put the lights. Speaking of writing rather than cinematography as an instructive and as a, as a beginning for you, you're back with an old partner here. Yes, Paul Schrader. Yeah. You yeah. called him up and said what? Let's just, this well, is, if I'm going to tell this story, I need you to tell it with me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, uh, he just has a, he has an understanding of this type of material. Uh, when I read the book, I read the galleys that uh, Scott Rudin sent me. Right. Um, Rudin, first of all, when he read this, optioned it yes. and immediately optioned it with you in mind. Yes. You know, yeah. Being the producer he is. Yes. And uh, uh, over the years, he sent me some remarkable material that uh, I passed on. But this one, I said, this is really interesting. I said, it's a, it's a different kind of story. There's no straight narrative. It's episodic because the nature of the job is episodic. Uh, but this crisis that this uh, young, well-meaning man is uh, undergoing is... is uh, something that we all have to stay in touch with you know mm -hmm. uh, you think of uh, paramedics you hear the sirens in the city you know what it's like when you're in a cab mm -hmm. and you know the sirens behind you the cab's got to move of course it doesn't usually but you know it's got to move and um, you try not to think about it but in a funny way it's like delegating uh, caring in a way we delegate caring to the paramedics we delegate caring to nurses or exactly. hospitals exactly. but we can't do that we have to stay in touch with I think uh, these feelings yeah I'm, I'm not saying that we should all you know, run after ambulances, but what I'm saying is that there has to be uh, that line uh, uh, of, of uh, humanity uh, between us and the city and the people who are suffering in the city. I think so. Yeah. I think so. And that's what's so interesting about these guys. And Schrader understands that. What's Why does it? he understand it? Well, because he's of the city? or uh, No, I think, I think uh, for his religious convictions and uh, uh, his, um, his, his upbringing, which actually is Calvinist, yeah. uh, which is very different from mine, which is Roman Catholic. I, I believe that he had he was not allowed to see films until he was 18 years old. So, so it's a very very strict upbringing. And uh, but he has a line. He has a line into uh, suffering and uh, uh, redemption and yeah. what it means to uh, what it means to forgive yourself. You too. Said, that's the idea. The first thing, was taxi the first thing you worked on? Yeah. Taxi then raging raging bull raging bull and then last temptation of Christ and then the last temptation of Christ, which yeah. was. A, so something, a film you always wanted to yeah, make, and, yeah. and you got Ovitz and others yeah, to sort of yeah. make it happen for you. And then you stopped working together, because I think he said there was such big... It goes... <laughs> yeah, exactly. In exactly. the room. Yeah, you can't. We, he, couldn't be in the, we couldn't be in the same room together. Is that right? <laughs> Some, sometimes. But he's, he's, more, he's more cutting with his remarks that way. He just says something. He's the kind of guy who says something to me, and two weeks later, I think of an answer. You know, just, <laughs> yeah, I should I have told I, him that. You know what I mean? I hate that. <laughs> I'll get him next time. <laughs> you called him up. So you called him up this time and said... Yeah, I said, Paul, this you got to read. I said, read you have this. to read this. And uh, uh, he read it and uh, really responded to it right away because of the nature of what's, what Frank Pierce is going through. Um, Frank Pierce is a char the character by Nick Cage. By Nick Cage, yeah. He's in an he's in a emergency Para room yeah, paramedic. Paramedic yeah. who's, uh, who's had about... He's going through a, a battle fatigue, really. Yeah. And he's really wondering, is he making any difference at all? Yeah. That's the thing. He goes in one corner and he saves a drug dealer, right, who's maybe yeah. responsible for hundreds of deaths. He goes in another corner, and he just happens for some for some freak accident lose a twelve year old homeless kid. So he's thinking at this point in his life, is there any pattern to all this? Is there, is there meaning to any of? Am I making a difference? Um, but what's interesting about Frank, and this is what Paul caught on to, is that he loves the job because he brings people back to life, um, which makes him feel like God. Yeah. And he's got to learn in this movie that he's not God. Yeah. You see, that's the thing, and that's what we thought was so interesting about it, because he takes on the suffering. Everybody puts it on his own shoulders and can't get through it now. At the end, they finally tell him, nobody asked you to suffer. And, and that's beyond the fact that it was a New York story. That's oh, what turned yeah. you on, that's this whole notion me. of that's this kind of me. emotional fact, struggle exactly. with some kind of redemption or some kind yeah. of something. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, um, I, I think, in fact, what almost held me back a little bit was, you know, the fact that it was another New York story and that how do you shoot an ambulance at night in New York? I mean, I've shot a lot of scenes at night, at night in New York. What different way yeah. can I find to, to do these scenes? And but the, the first night I went out with a real ambulance, though, I figured it out, which was the hallucinatory aspect of it. When you're sitting in the front, yeah. uh, the, the spinners are going, the rock and roll is playing, 
uh, cabs are attacking you. You know, it's, yeah. it's like uh, suddenly you, you realize uh, <laughs> you think you see things that are not there. Yeah. You know, and if you stand there long enough, uh, it's quite, it's quite, a, it's quite it an experience. It has an effect on the brain. Yeah, it has an effect, a hallucinatory effect in the brain, yeah. I think. Cage, was he an obvious choice for you, or was this the first choice or second choice? No, or? it was my first choice. And uh, I, I, I love his expressive face and yeah. the nature of his acting. He could go, he could go as high as Lon Chaney in uh, the 20s. Yeah. You know, and uh, he could be as um, uh, introverted too, uh, in the same to the same degree. And his his face and his eyes to convey the suffering that this man is is undergoing. You know, see, now here's what's amazing about you, Marnie. You just said as high as Lon Chaney. Da 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 da. Do you know anyone on God's green earth who may know Lon Chaney at this point? No. <laughs> <laughs> who has seen as many, oh. Oh. analyzed as many, thought more about film? than you have. Do you know anybody? And I, who? Uh, I mean, I don't know whether Stevens like that or not, but I, no, I mean, no, he's get not. scholars. Steve, I mean, Steve, you just, you can't. I, I just, well, you know, they put me in a movie theater when I was about four years old. That just was when it. you had asthma and all that yeah. stuff, yeah. I mean, that was my, it was my uh, sanctuary. That and then the church. Yeah. You know, when I was about seven years old, they put me in a church. And so, then you, so you thought about being a priest at some yeah. point, too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they, movies, it's either I'm going to be a movie maker or I'm going to be a god maker. Right, exactly. Yeah. Or, or you had, uh, well, the neighborhood I came from, you, you know, which was filled, and I have to always say this clearly these days because too many films and stories are made about uh, just one aspect of it being Italian-American, which is the organized crime, that there were a lot of very, very decent people there trying to make a family, trying to keep a family together and trying to create a family life. But there was a small element that was organized crime. So... Uh, in seeing the, uh, growing up around eight or nine years old and seeing the people get respect, um, real respect with the organized crime figures and the priests. So you can either become one or the other if, yeah. you know, and you know you're not cut out for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the guts to, or any, you yeah, know, right. that's, that's something wrong about that calling. one. It's, it's yeah. not my calling, you know, yet you're, you're drawn to it. And this is what's interesting about that. You're drawn to it because the nature of the power that they, that they, um, that they, um, that permeates them in a way. And the same with the younger priests, by the way, not the older one. The older ones were more for the Italian American, the older Italian American community. Mm -hmm. the, the priests I'm talking about are younger priests, 21, 22 years old, who came in and, and gave us uh, uh, oh, uh, classical music to listen to and gave us a book uh, written by Dwight MacDonald, uh, yeah. Memoirs of a Revolutionist. Uh, this is all very interesting and uh, opened our minds a little bit. Um, but um, uh, literally, I mean, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I didn't have the real vocation for being a priest. Do you? <laughs> you know, it yeah, didn't, didn't work out. And yeah. at some point, you were so madly in love with film, too, that yes. you couldn't resist the Lord. Yeah. yeah. Um, does, did, the, when you think about Goodfellas and the films that you have made, the Casino. Yes. Do you hear from organized crime? I mean, is there some sense of that Marty understands? You know, in the same way that if, if you are in, of organized crime, you know that Pelleggi understands. Yes, no, Nick knows, yeah. He knows. Nick knows, yeah. yeah. Now, or is that simply more a question of where Nick, how smart he is in understanding of that culture? Uh, Nick knows it, uh, and he knows all the uh, Machiavellian ways, he knows all the details and uh, um, the struggles for power and why people made a move this way instead of that and way. And it comes out of a journalistic... And it comes out of a journalistic um, uh, integrity and, and, a, and a, a, a pursuit of, of uh, finding the truth. Um, but there's no doubt, it. there's one... When they arrested the head of the mafia in Sicily, Risi, or yeah, Risi, right, right. he had a he had a second in command, and uh, uh, he was quoted in the Italian papers as the only film that had showed accuracy of what it was like to be in a life of organized crime as Goodfellas, particularly the scene that Joe Pesci improvised, which is, "Why do you think I'm funny?" Yeah, he said that I mean, is exactly what it's about. In a split second, you could die. Yeah. You have to be very careful, and that's a dangerous world. You know, uh, that's the one time I heard uh, that uh, there was some sort of a. Recognition. Yeah, yeah, response. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take a look at this. Be back to this film. Uh, here is Nick Cage and, and uh, John Goodman, who plays Larry, and they're talking about dinner plans. Here it is. Bringing out the dead. The coffee and whiskey. Lucky you ain't dead with it. I, I got it. Half fried chicken and fries. Let's go. Yeah, are you going to find yourself, in terms of people who write about this movie, making the ob comparisons with Taxi Driver? Oh, absolutely, I think. Uh, well, on the surface, you have the obvious. Even Schrader said it when he read it. He said, Marty, obviously, they're going to say a man driving a vehicle which deals with the public at night, <laughs> at night, in New York, on the west side. Yes. Uh, they're going to say, obviously, a return to Taxi Driver. Well, it's not quite. I mean, you know, uh, 
on the surface, uh, there were those similarities, but uh, after uh, past those similarities, it's very, very different. It's a very different film. He's a different character. He's a guy who is constructive, not destructive. Uh, Travis, unfortunately, you know, makes that switch from uh, uh, reality to fantasy. He lives out the fantasy. By mis that, that's a bad thing to do by the end of the film. Whereas here, he's constructive. He wants to make a difference. You know, he's really an idealist. When are you going to work with Bobby again? I hope in Gangs of New York, the next picture. Oh, the ne that, tell yeah. me about that, only because th this is another film you have wanted to make yeah. for years yes. and years and years. That, that and it, came out of the ground, in a way, out of, out of spending so much time in St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, yeah. which was built, I think, in 1802, 1812, I'm not sure. But it was the first Catholic cathedral in New York, at a time when um, there was a lot of hostility against Catholics in New York, particularly by the Anglo-Saxon gangs that, that, uh, that were uh, stationed down in the lower part of Manhattan called the Five Points. Um, and there were a lot of Anglo-Saxon gangs that felt that uh, they were white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and there was enough people in America. Stop getting off the boats. Right. <laughs> we don't want any Catholics, don't want any Jews, don't want any blacks, don't want any Italians. We're full. We're, we're, really, we're full here now. Yeah, right. And it's really good. We've got to work it. And we fought in the revolution, too. You didn't fight in the revolution. Right. Yeah. You see, which is true. They, this, is, this is the way they thought. Yeah. And they thought that the Catholics were going to be, Irish Catholics particularly, yeah. uh, were going to be direct, a direct line to the Vatican. And so uh, there was a lot of danger at that time, and, and a lot of uh, the city politics was, uh, I'd say most of the city politics was worked out through violence yeah. in the streets. And in fact, the 19th... City politics? Yeah, because Tammany Hall got involved right. and started using the immigrants, and uh, there was split. There was one man in Tammany Hall who was pro-Native uh, pro American, uh, not Indians, but Native American, uh, uh, white Anglo-Saxon, and um, uh, Boss Tweed understood that the more people getting off the boats... And the more he treats them nicely by giving them soup at the dock, the more he can uh, compete more he, with. Yeah, more he more he can compete with the other people and more and get more votes, yeah. uh, because this is the idea of America. They're gonna, they're never going to stop coming off the boats. Yeah. That's America, and uh, they fought they fought so badly. Um, in fact, that the more research we we're doing, we realize that the 19th century is the most violent century in American history. You know, yeah. uh, the Civil War is like a continuation of the Revolution, yeah. in a way. And then the film begins in 1846 and ends in 1863 during the draft riots in New York, which were the worst uh, riots in American history. When were uh, they in 19, when 18, 18, 1863? 1863, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the problem there was that uh, after Gettysburg, I believe uh, Lincoln needed conscription. He needed, uh, he needed to uh, draft people, and he started a draft, and it was announced at 42nd Street. Um, and the only thing is, if you had $300, you didn't have to go. So who had to go? Goodbye, well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who had to go? The poor people down in the five sure. points. And uh, the city was uh, up in arms for about four days, five days. The Union troops came in. Uh, and the film resolves itself around that struggle. You in, know? A, in a sense, that's what's happened in Vietnam in terms of wasn't buying your way out with cash. But really? you could go to college. You, ah, know, and you could yeah. get all kinds of deferments. Exactly. You know, some exactly. Form, or because of wealth, you had connections and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why so much of the burden yeah. of dying in Vietnam was... So much of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. Same thing, the idea, yeah, yeah, you know, who's yeah. left to fight the wars. <laughs> uh, this, this has been a long time story, though. You've, wanted, you've been intrigued by this for a while. Yeah, because I, going around living in the Lower East Side and living in the, uh, Mott Street and Elizabeth Street, I, I saw the buildings were very old, and I began to read the tombstones that went back to 18, 1810, and, and I was just fascinated by the old history, and I heard that at one point St. Patrick's Old Cathedral was, was um, uh, defended, yeah. by Catholics in 1844, I believe, against the Know-Nothings, who were a Native American group. Um, and I wondered what the city was like at that time. So I did, I, over the years, I've been doing research. And myself and Jay Cox began working on a script around 1975. And we've taken it up to about, oh, 93, 1993, when we decided to rewrite the whole thing. Yeah. And now, for the past year, we're actually working on a story, uh, the backdrop of which is that, that period and, and is that... Um, that uh, part of Manhattan. So Jay's the, the screenwriter on this. Yeah, Jay and From myself, and um, yeah, and we're we're working on it about nine months now. We have a uh, draft seven. We're about to go into draft eight. Yeah. Um, Why is it that screenwriting takes so many drafts? I think, in this particular case, we were we needed to find. It's an ambitious story, an yeah. ambitious film. Weaving I should so say. many themes and so many weaving different groups. the politics, weaving in um, the anthropology of the time too. What these gangs were really like pretty much more like, they were, more, they were actually more aligned with the Anglo-Saxon gangs and Anglo-Saxon tribes. Uh, yeah. So they had tribal warfare in a way. The, the um, Irish Catholics, to a certain extent, um, had a, a culture, to a certain extent, had, had a tribal culture also. So that uh, if you look back at what the Anglo-Saxon tribes were like, the Celts, the gods were gods of war in a yeah. way. So um, I'm also interested in how civilization breaks down.
And when it breaks down, it becomes a tribe, and smaller than that, a clan, and smaller than that, a family, the blood unit. You know? And so when everything is taken away, which is what happened downtown, um, to the extent that it was known around the world, the worst corners, the worst corner in the world was called the Five Points. Even Charles Dickens, when he came here in the 1850s, made a visit to the Five Points and wrote about it in his American notes, said it's the worst thing. Worst, London can't compare. London is heaven compared to what the Five Points is like. We have nothing like Nothing like this. And so, so I'm fascinated by what happens uh, to groups of people stuck in a situation, uh, oppressed uh, politically, economically, and how they, what form do they, do they take? Uh, a gang is really, in a sense, like a tribe. And uh, what, are, what, what, are their, what, are their, what are their standards? You know, how, how uh, everything, is, everything is literally decided through violence, uh, through fighting. And that fighting becomes part of the culture, really part of the culture. What well, seems central, I mean, this is a, sim a giant simplification, but so much of what it seems to me your work has to do about is a individuals or families caught up in some kind of huge conflict mm -hmm. of which at the end there is either redemption or in fact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. death yeah you know they yeah. fall yeah. off the you know like casino yeah like yeah. casino yeah. sure exactly in the end you know yeah. it's resolved by either death or some <laughs> coming to yeah yeah terms. this is a little tricky gangs in new york is tricky because the action there's a lot of action in it and it's a pretty traditional story too a young boy has to avenge the death of his father etc is this leonardo Di uh, dicaprio, DiCaprio yeah. he's in He's in it, definitely oh, in man, it. Oh, man, that's... Yeah. So it's, De Niro, he's great. DiCaprio. Yeah, I mean, it'd be very interesting, you know. And, uh, I mean, the thing about it is no that... No wonder it, you want to make this. Yeah, I'm dying to make this picture for years, but because it, it's more about the history of the city. Yeah. And the history of the city being the history of America, really. Yeah. I think, particularly in the 19th century. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it's difficult because there is so much action in the picture. How does one deal with violence these days on, in cinema? Uh, especially after making Casino, where at the end of the film, uh, Joe Pesci and his brother are beaten to death with baseball bats uh, by their best friends. And when you do that, I don't, there's, no more to, there's no place to go, yeah, in exactly. a sense. It is the dead end of organized crime. It is the dead end of that kind of lifestyle. That's where you wind up. And uh, here, I've got to be careful. I have to, I have to think of other ways to, in, to infer the violence what, rather, than, rather than be blunt about it. What is it about this thing of filmmaking that turns you on the most? What, is, what part of problem solving, what, what part of it? I mean, you sat as we watched this. Yeah. And we watched the scene of the, yeah. uh, you know, and you said to me, as you said earlier in the conversation, you know, it's hallucinatory because you're here and here and here and all these lights and mm -hmm. things are going on. Mm -hmm. You got rock music and you yeah. got the, the all yeah. kinds of stuff happening. And yet you plotted that out. Yes. I said storyboard, you said no. Miniaturization of storyboard. Miniaturization of storyboard. Yeah. Yeah. But what is it about this process um, that, you know, is it the editing? Is it creating the scene for me for me if first of all you need you need the story you need the script Finding to be the there you need the script to be right. there you need it to be on the page in terms of the emotion and in terms of uh, something with which the audience can empathize in terms of characters you need the audience to care about somebody okay that's one thing so we've been taking over the years we've been pushing we've been pushing the envelope on that though over the years with mean streets taxi driver raging bull and uh, particularly raging bull and even uh, Goodfellas and uh, Casino. So we're pushing the edge there. How much can you care for a person if he's this bad or if she's that bad, you know? And can you still care? There's some yeah. out there I know can still care, so that's pretty good, okay. Now, let's see if we can push a little more. Now, the, the only thing for me, though, is that uh, uh, that's one thing. That's gotta be on the page. But then for me, it's the, literally, the imagining, imagining of um, shots, one shot being cut to the other and the emotional and psychological impact of that cut and the movement of that cut, in other words, uh, two shots together, two moving shots together, create another movement altogether in your mind that isn't there. Yeah. You see, yeah. it's almost like dance, like choreography. And that's why uh, this was a, a tough one to do because I had one third of the film in the cab of an ambulance. Three different yeah. ambulances, true, but it's an ambulance, you know. Right. And so how many times can you see spinners going, uh, <laughs> you know, what angles could you get? And I'd say, well, you know, to a certain extent, you would say, listen, just do it simply. Uh, but I wanted to recreate that feeling I had driving around with the... Um, with the paramedics in New York at night. I wanted to recreate that hallucinatory feeling, especially of a man who's having somewhat of a breakdown in the picture. You know, he thinks he sees the per peripheral vision uh, uh, tricks you in the street yeah. at night. You think you see somebody coming at you, there's nobody there, yeah. you know? And that's what I wanted to get. So that, does, that was like a perfect um, reason for trying to put the, um, trying to make this yeah. film and put the shots together on paper. So, but, so then you are saying the excitement of it for you, in terms of the ultimate excitement, yeah. after you've got a story, is figuring out how you can Visually interpret. Visually interpret this yeah, story. Yeah. I mean, that's. that's if the key if you thing. had to say that's the 
highest level of genius that you bring to it. Forget genius, don't argue about it. I mean, that, that's what it is, I, is that your capacity to understand and make that happen. I, I think so, but I also, I also feel Gift, that... maybe a better word. Yeah, I also feel that I have to like the people in the film. I have to love them. The characters yeah, or the actors? The characters. Or both? Yeah, both, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Both. First, I start with the characters. And um, if you have actors who are, who are soulmates, too, that's great. Mm. That's good. You don't usually, sometimes you don't get that, but yeah. uh, if you're very lucky, if well, you Well, you do. get it because you go back to the same actress. Same, I, that's one of the reasons I go back. <laughs> I want to work with we people all, I love. Yeah, we, we all know each other. We know, you know, <laughs> well, look, that take is yeah. good. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, right. uh, that sort of thing. But um, also I have the same philosophy, too. Uh, De Niro has a certain philosophy, Keitel. Uh, and it's the same philosophy you have? It's yes, a shared philosophy. Yeah, yeah, it is. Which is? It's, well, dealing with the subject matter that we see it a certain way. And there's a certain truth that we try to get to. Uh, Joe Pesci, too, has that about, the, about a raging bull or about, uh, about a Goodfellas or a casino. Uh, that uh, we just sense when something isn't quite right. We know that that gesture is wrong, you know. Uh, you can't direct it. They have to, they have to be it. Um, yeah. A guy like Pesci is it. Keitel, to a certain extent, uh, different, although he's, he's in the, uh, the wonderful range of, like, the piano and the bad lieutenant, yeah. stuff yeah. like this. He's amazing. And De Niro and myself, just one of those things. We, we seem to be drawn to the same subject matter, the same type of character with very little articulation, verbal articulation about why, you know. And in a way, we just look at each other sometimes, and it's like, yeah, I know, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, you know what happens, when that kind of thing happens, you know what the next, res you know what the next move is. I said, yeah, well, all right, so we better not. We better, that, that escalates everything. I said, no, that escalates everything. You can't uh, do that to the person. Uh, uh, you try to balance it out, but I think, um, there's no doubt, I think we're interested in people who are flawed, people like ourselves, uh, and to see if anybody else cares about them. Yeah. I mean, but also people have some passion. Yes, yeah, yeah. You very know, much, very much they so. They have some yeah. sense of wanting yeah. to do something with life. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Are you surprised that De Niro has this entrepreneurial flair? No, no, I think he loves people, and I think he loves to, uh, uh, I mean, he loves a lot of activity around him, and be yeah. part of that activity, yeah. whether it's um, uh, working in the office area, or it's the restaurant, or, or a, Whatever you know, it's uh, apparently they're not going to be able to build that uh, in Brooklyn. In yeah, Brooklyn, because, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Yeah, we don't know why the, it didn't work out. The yeah. mayor is saying, mm, <laughs> you know, New York Miramax needs, is a factor. Oh and all God, New, New York needs a good studio. Well, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, to take yeah. advantage and have that kind yes. of complex in. Yeah. You know, I don't know what yeah. the people who evidently may or may not get it, uh, who they may or may not have lost out to, but I mean, the, the, the idea of using the boroughs of Manhattan. It's fantastic. Yeah. As yeah. a the rising yeah. of yeah. of this a whole new community in place exactly for exactly. making movies because of all the people like you and De Niro that are part of the Sydney Lament and that yeah. are part of this community yeah. yeah you know let me just do one more thing here this is a scene in which we've been talking about the idea of what happens to characters Cage who plays a character Frank is upset losing his mind and upset over the types of victims he has treated that night here it is why is everything a cardiac arrest what happened to chest pain, difficulty breathing, fractured hands? Yeah, yeah, come on, people! Let me just take you to a very different place. Uh, you were in Venice for the festival. You've been doing that for some. You were yes. doing this series. Yes, a um, uh, documentary. We, yes. We're beginning. Yeah, you're beginning. It's called La Dolce Cinema? La Dolce Cinema, yeah. 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 And, and, and we know... Tell me about it. Well, um, over the past 14 years or 15 years, uh, uh, my associate, Raphael Donato, myself, would travel around the world and would always be talking about Italian cinema and my connection with Italian cinema and um, Italian movies. Um, and it's kind of complicated, but bottom line is that I began to realize that, uh, yes, I may have been parked in a movie theater where my brother or my mother and father may have taken me to a movie theater a lot of the times in the late 40s, all through the 50s, but that was a certain kind of film. That was the Hollywood cinema, which I adore. And I thought I wanted to be like a Hollywood director, which... I guess I am, but not quite. It's a different, I don't know what it is. But maybe what happened is this, that around 1948, they started showing, um, they had television, and uh, my father got a TV set, a 16-inch RCA Victor. It was a big screen for that time. And it was in Corona, Queens, uh, because then we moved back to Elizabeth Street right after that. Um, and my mother's parents were living out there, uh, my mother's, uh, my grandparents. Uh, they spoke Sicilian only, didn't speak English, were not citizens. They had, they had come over as immigrants. Um, plus a lot of my mother's family were there. And on, on Friday nights, I believe, they had uh, films, Italian films for the Italian-American New York community in one of the local stations. And of course, the first 
night this thing comes on, they have my grandparents come over because they didn't have a TV. And everybody sat around the set, and up comes Paisan by yeah. Rossellini. Yeah. And the first episode is about Sicily. And I began to notice that the people in the movie are talking just like my grandparents. Yeah. And then I began to see, as the picture develops, uh, especially the Neapolitan episode where the kid uh, buys the uh, black soldier on the black market, uh, which is an extraordinary sequence. Um, I began to see them start to cry and uh, uh, say to myself, well, you know, five years old. And these things, they're movies. These are movies. They're not documentaries, but they're so real that they seem to be happening as it's being photographed, as opposed to the Hollywood films, which is not to put down the Hollywood films, something else. Then there was another film, Open City, and then another one called Bicycle Thief, mm. which was extraordinary. The relationship between the father and son is amazing. And so it struck me that, to a certain extent, that, you know, part of me is there not here in America. And um, I think over the years, if I've had to make a choice um, between two types of pictures, I always tend to go to make a film more in that direction because mm -hmm. maybe the impact of those movies, those, those grainy black and white 60 millimeter prints that were showing scratched up with commercials in them, um, maybe um, that's what really struck me, uh, the empathy for the people. And later on seeing a film like Umberto D. Mm. Uh, which is on tomorrow, tonight, I think, at four in the morning on Turner, Turner Classic Movies. Uh, <laughs> and what's but, amazing you know, about that is you know that. Yeah, I like, check each day. See you, what's you, just, really, in, just in you case. You check every day to see what's... Just in case. Yeah. You know, you never some obscure B thing yeah. that you one night, a year from now, you want to see. And you will know? you record this or will you I'll watch them? them? Record them. Will yes. you record, oh, record them? Record. I have a big library of uh, Laserdiscs videos and uh, DVDs now. Yeah. Uh, DVDs, yeah. So what's happened is that I think we decided to, to uh, explore how Italian movies influence me. So I take, I do, I do my relationship to Italian films from 1948 to 1970 when I started directing. I stopped there. So, uh, you, of course, we're talking about the great period. We're talking right. about De Sica, Rossellini, um, uh, uh, Fellini, uh, Visconti, um, Pasolini, and all that whole group, uh, Francesco Rossi. Yeah. Uh, it's just amazing movies that struck me right around the time, too, that I started making films at NYU. So, uh, Divorce Italian Style by Pietro Germi. Right. which we looked at again is a masterpiece you know it's an extraordinary movie um and also a little further than that by the end of the piece we're going to discuss just the films made in sicily that that uh, kind of ties me to sicily because i'm sicilian on both sides uh right. and uh there's something very special about sicily and the land of sicily i was there nine years ago my parents they visited we visited some relatives there and uh, uh the, there's roots there i don't know i'm trying to explore it and uh do a sort of homage to it in a way. The last three films we talk about are Divorce Italian Style, Salvatore Giuliano, and we end with The Leopard, Visconti's yeah, The Leopard, about yeah. Sicily. You know, so that's, uh, it'll probably be about three episodes of two hours each. The first two hours we showed in Venice, uh, the closing night of Venice, uh, uh, media set is, has given us the money to make this, which is really yeah, is good. Is this going to appear on a... Uh is this going to be part of a feature release, or is it going to be on television? Part for... of it will be a feature release, yeah. and then uh, the rest will be on television. And, and my documentary on American cinema will be on television on Turner Classic Movies starting in January, finally. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened. You mean you've been doing it for a while, and now it's going to be on the air. It'll be on the air, yeah. 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 Uh, it's always great to have you here. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Much success with this. Uh, it opens... Bringing Out the Dead opens on October 22nd. Nick Cage, John Goodman, uh, Patricia Arquette, and others. I, uh, we should do this more often. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.